where GTX began, 2008 to 2009. Before 2008, buying an NVIDIA GPU felt like decoding the matrix. GeForce 8800, 9600, 7950. You needed a PhD in forum diving just to figure out which number meant good and which meant why did I waste my money. Then, in 2008, NVIDIA did something simple but brilliant. They added three letters that changed everything. GTX. The GTX 200 series launched in 2008, built on NVIDIA's Tesla architecture. This was the moment GPUs became more than just graphics cards. NVIDIA started pushing CUDA cores as a major selling point. Suddenly, your graphics card wasn't just for games. It could do physics simulations, computations, and workloads previously reserved for CPUs. Cards like the GTX 260, 275, 280, and 285 aggressively pushed performance. NVIDIA even released the GTX 260 Core 216, a slightly upgraded card with more cores, proving that GPU naming was getting out of control. Then came the GTX 295, two GPUs on one card, over $500, consuming power like a small furnace and asking tough questions of your power supply. This was for people who wanted the fastest GPU money could buy. No compromises. Around this time, NVIDIA also acquired PhysX. Suddenly, games featured dynamic debris, flowing cloth, and realistic particle effects, especially on NVIDIA hardware. Performance sometimes took a hit, but the visual payoff was immediate, giving NVIDIA a clear technical edge and a new marketing angle. Better graphics, better physics, better experience. In short, the GTX era began as a way to separate high-end performance from the rest, while also redefining what a graphics card could do. It was the start of the modern GPU age. The Space Heaters, 2010 to 2011. In 2010, Nvidia launched the GTX 400 series with one clear philosophy. Performance first, your comfort never. Cooling, optional. Noise, also optional. Power efficiency, Nvidia hadn't even heard the term. The GTX 480 didn't just run hot, it became a legend for the wrong reasons. With a TDP pushing 250 to 300 watts, it turned gaming sessions into sauna sessions. Your PC case became a space heater, your room temperature climbed, and the fan noise? Jet engine preparing for takeoff. People joked about frying eggs on it. They weren't entirely joking. The rest of the 400 series followed the same theme. GTX 470 and 465 pulled the heat and noise back a little, but not enough to call them quiet or easygoing. Then came a surprise the GTX 460. Finally, cooler, more efficient, and still delivering solid performance, it became a safe recommendation. No more will my room melt worries. No extreme airflow required. By 2011, Nvidia had learned its lesson. Instead of scrapping Fermi, they refined it, and the GTX 500 series was born. The GTX 580 fixed the flagship's flaws, faster, quieter, and more efficient. It finally delivered top-tier performance without feeling like it might explode. The GTX 570 offered similar benefits with slightly lower power draw, and the GTX 560 Ti emerged as the mid-range hero. Solid performance, overclocking potential, and none of the drama that had haunted the 400 series. For the first time in years, Nvidia had a GPU line that felt performant and reasonable, powerful, but without making your PC case, power supply, or patient suffer. Nvidia finally gets it right, 2012-2013. 2012 brought the Kepler architecture and the GTX 600 series, and suddenly Nvidia felt like it had a clue. The flagship GTX 680 didn't just outperform the previous generation, it did so quietly, efficiently, and without turning your PC into a mini space heater. For the first time in years, buying a flagship card didn't feel like a compromise. Kepler's real game changer? GPU Boost. Instead of locking your GPU to a fixed clock speed, Kepler dynamically boosted performance whenever thermals and power allowed. In other words, your GPU started overclocking itself, often better than most people could do manually. The rest of the GTX 600 lineup followed the same philosophy. GTX 670 offered near flagship speeds for less money. GTX 660 Ti and 660 covered the mid-range, and even entry-level cards finally felt balanced and efficient. At the top, the GTX 690 reminded everyone Nvidia could still go absurd when it wanted. Dual GPUs, outrageous power draw, sky-high price, and mostly unnecessary but absolutely spectacular. Then came a surprise, the original Titan. Priced at $999, Titan wasn't meant for your average gamer. It blurred the line between gaming and workstation cards, offering massive memory and unlocked performance. 
Suddenly, a single GPU could serve both developers, content creators, and enthusiasts. A prosumer card before that was even a category. Kepler didn't stop there. In 2013, NVIDIA refreshed the architecture with the GTX 700 series, refining what already worked. The GTX 780 and 780 Ti pushed high-end performance even further, while the Titan Black doubled down on the idea that one GPU could do almost everything, if you were willing to pay for it. Mid-range cards hit the sweet spot too. The GTX 760 became a household name, striking the perfect balance of price, performance, and efficiency. And the GTX 750 Ti quietly hinted at the next revolution, Maxwell Architecture. Quick question, which NVIDIA generation was your first? GTX 400 Space Heater, GTX 1060 Workhorse, or did you skip straight to RTX? Drop it in the comments, I'm genuinely curious. And if you're finding this trip down GPU memory lane helpful, hit that like button. It actually helps more people discover these videos. The Efficiency King, 2014 to 2016. Maxwell was NVIDIA finally learning how to be both smart and strong. At the budget end, the GTX 750 Ti seemed almost magical in 2014. Drawing just 60 watts and requiring no external power connectors, it could run straight from a motherboard slot. For small form factor builds or budget rigs, it was revolutionary. A tiny card that played modern games without forcing you to upgrade your PSU. Efficiency had found its poster child. Humble in size but mighty in impact. At the high end, Maxwell showed Nvidia had refined its formula to near perfection. The GTX 980 Ti, priced around $650, delivered performance nearly matching the Titan X but without the outrageous price tag. Powerful, efficient, and drama-free. It didn't fry rooms like Fermi or intimidate cases like Kepler's dual GPU monsters. Then there was the GTX 970, arguably Maxwell's most famous card. It hit the sweet spot of performance, price, and power draw, becoming the best-selling card of its generation. Gamers loved it, until the VRAM controversy surfaced. Advertised as 4 GB, only 3.5 GB ran at full speed, while the remaining 0.5 GB was slower, leading to occasional performance quirks. It wasn't catastrophic, but it mattered. People noticed, reviews got heated, and the 970 became as infamous as it was beloved. Maxwell also marked a turning point for VR readiness. Cards like the 970 and 980 had enough horsepower to drive early VR headsets smoothly, making Maxwell the generation that truly opened high-end gaming to virtual reality. The rest of the lineup, GTX 960, 950, and the Titan X, reinforced Maxwell's core lesson. Efficiency wasn't a bonus. It was a priority. Finally, you could build a high-end gaming PC without needing industrial-grade cooling or a backup generator just to power your GPU. The GOAT generation, 2016 to 2018. Pascal isn't just a generation. It's the generation people still measure everything against in 2025. Here's how you know a GPU generation was special. People still refuse to upgrade from it years later. That's Pascal. It wasn't just another GPU release. It was the generation that redefined what good enough meant for nearly a decade. The flagship of the era, the GTX 1080 Ti launched in 2017 and it remains legendary. Even eight years later, some gamers and enthusiasts still benchmark it. Its combination of raw power, efficiency, and reasonable thermals made it the longest lived flagship Nvidia has ever produced. For a generation, this card didn't just compete, it dominated quietly teaching future GPUs what staying power really meant. Below it, the GTX 1080 and GTX 1070 continued the trend. Compared to Maxwell, Pascal delivered a 60-80% to 80 performance jump, making mid-range and high-end builds feel like rocket ships. Gamers who upgraded from 900 series cards immediately noticed the difference, and performance per watt had finally caught up with expectations set back in the Fermi days. The GTX 1060, particularly the 6GB model, became the crown jewel of the mid-range. It hit the perfect balance of performance, efficiency, and price. And for over four years, it was the number one GPU on Steam. Millions of gamers around the world built their rigs around it, making it perhaps the most successful Nvidia card of all time. Even the smaller cards had their moments. The GTX 1050 Ti pulling just 75 watts became the go-to choice for eSports setups. It didn't need an external power connector didn't heat rooms and could run competitive titles without breaking a sweat. Pascal showed that efficiency and strong performance weren't just reserved for the flagship anymore. 
Of course, no Pascal story would be complete without mentioning the 2017 to 2018 crypto mining boom. Demand for GPUs exploded, and suddenly mid-range cards like the 1060 were selling for two to three times their MSRP. Gamers had to fight tooth and nail to get one, while mining rigs gobbled up every card on site. It was chaotic. It was frustrating. But it cemented Pascal's reputation as a performance workhorse. At the very top, the Titan X Pascal and Titan XP catered to prosumers and creators. They were expensive, massive, and absurdly powerful. But they also hinted at NVIDIA's continued interest in bridging gaming and professional workloads. The last GTX cards ever made, 2019. By 2019, NVIDIA was on the cusp of a new era. The RTX 20 series had arrived with ray tracing cores, fancy marketing, and prices that made many gamers wince. Not everyone could afford it. Enter the GTX 16 series, the final generation of GTX cards. Touring architecture, but stripped down. No ray tracing, no tensor cores, just solid performance at prices people could actually stomach. It was like giving gamers a consolation prize, except the prize turned out to be surprisingly good. The GTX 1660 Ti, 1660 Super, and 1660 carried the mantle at the high end of the GTX lineup. The 1660 Super, priced around $229, became the best value card of 2019. It hit a sweet spot in performance, efficiency, and cost that made it a favorite for mid-range gamers and anyone who didn't want to mortgage their house for an RTX 2060. Below it, the GTX 1650 carved out a new budget throne. It came in several flavors, GDDR5, GDDR6, Super, and became the default recommendation for compact builds, casual gamers, and esports setups on a shoestring budget. It didn't make headlines, but it did its job exceptionally well. Then there was the GTX 1630, which arrived quietly in 2022. It was a weird late addition nobody really asked for. Not powerful, not expensive, just there. A minor footnote in an otherwise solid generation. In early 2024, NVIDIA made it official. The GTX lineup was dead. No more new GTX cards. No more budget-friendly alternatives. The era that began with the GTX 200 series in 2008, 16 years of dominance, had quietly come to an end. GTX didn't die because it was bad. It died because NVIDIA decided the future was RTX, and everyone else could either pay up or get left behind. Ray Tracing Takes Over 2018-2022 to 2022. 2018, NVIDIA tried to sell us the future before the future existed. The RTX 20 series introduced ray tracing cores, tensor cores, and DLSS 1.0, tech that promised movie-quality lighting and reflections in real time. On paper, revolutionary. In practice, a disaster. Ray tracing killed your frame rates. DLSS 1.0 made games look like someone smeared Vaseline on your monitor, and almost no games even supported it at launch. Gamers paid hundreds of dollars extra for features they couldn't actually use. It was like buying a sports car that could only drive 30 miles per hour. Meanwhile, the GTX 16 series quietly outsold RTX 20 cards. Gamers weren't buying gimmicks. They were buying performance they could actually use at prices that didn't require a second mortgage. RTX looked flashy, but it was a solution to a problem few had yet. Then, Ampere arrived in 2020. The RTX 30 series fixed almost every issue. DLSS 2.0 gave huge performance gains. Ray tracing finally ran well, and games started shipping with proper support. Suddenly, Nvidia's vision made sense. The feature that had been a liability became a selling point. The Ampere cards were incredible, but not easy to get. The RTX 3080 in particular became a unicorn. Launch day was a nightmare. COVID disrupted supply chains. Crypto miners cleaned out inventories. And scalpers made headlines with automated buying bots. For years, actually buying a top-tier Ampere card felt like a lottery. Still, when people finally got their hands on these GPUs, the difference was clear. The RTX 3090 and 3080 Ti pushed performance and memory to unprecedented levels. Mid-range cards like the 3060 Ti and 3070 delivered incredible value and proved that ray tracing didn't have to be a luxury feature anymore. By 2022, the RTX series had firmly established the new standard. Games looked better, ran smoother, and NVIDIA's gamble on hardware-accelerated ray tracing finally paid off. Where we are now, 2022 to 2025. Fast forward to today, and NVIDIA has gone completely all-in on RTX. The GTX era is officially over, 
and the RTX 40 and newly announced 50 series are the only path forward. The RTX 4090 is the headline act. It's enormous, expensive, and absurdly powerful. Launching at $1,599, it's essentially a desktop supercomputer for your desk. DLSS 3.0 introduced frame generation, pushing frame rates to levels previously thought impossible, and showing just how far GPU technology has come since the GTX 200 series first defined high-end gaming. The rest of the 40 series carries that same philosophy. The 4080, 4070 Ti, 4070, and 4060 lineups cover every price tier, with varying performance and features. There was some disappointment, like the 4060 Ti 8GB, which underdelivered expectations for some gamers. But overall, these cards cemented efficiency, ray tracing, and AI-enhanced gaming as the standard. And now, in 2025, the RTX 50 series, codenamed Blackwell, has been announced. These cards introduce DLSS 4.0 with multi-frame generation, promising even smoother gameplay and pushing frame rates higher without overloading hardware. The 5090, already being called ridiculous by enthusiasts, continues the trend of NVIDIA steadily raising the bar. And that's every NVIDIA generation, from the GTX 200 space heaters to the RTX 50 series monsters. You know now why Pascal became legendary, why Fermi tried to cook your desk, and why the GTX 1060 became the most used GPU on Steam for half a decade. If you're ready to upgrade and want to skip the endless review rabbit hole, I've got an Amazon link in the description that takes you straight to the best-selling graphics cards. It's always updated with current prices and top-rated options, so you're not looking at recommendations from six months ago when half the cards are out of stock or overpriced. Now, here's the thing. You just learned about the brain behind your gaming performance, but what about everything else in your PC? The motherboard, RAM, storage, cooling. If those sound like random components instead of an actual system, you're not alone. That's exactly what we're covering next in Every Computer Component Explained Simply. We'll break down what each part does, why it matters, and which ones you should actually spend money on. No more guessing, no more overpaying for parts you don't need. Click the video on screen right now, and I'll see you there.